Well, it's good to be back in the pulpit. <laughs> Since I'm in the pulpit, let's play catch. <laughs> now back. Let's see, Isaiah. <laughs> you might have to run and get this. Over here, let's see. Oh, come on, Jeannie. <laughs> almost. Almost. That was a bad throw on my part. There, Isaiah. This is catch at Grace Baptist Church on a Sunday morning. Something high and spiritual. Yeah. Yeah. Let's see, Brent. <laughs> so close. So close. All right. All right. Now in the back. Let's see if we can get it in the back. Here, catch it. Howard, did you get it? Now throw it back. Okay. Now, now Cameron, you catch it. Now, now throw it back. What's the point? Without a ball, catch makes no sense, right? Without the gospel, your life makes no sense. What we're going to talk about today is the most important thing that you can ever hear or understand, and without it, it has no influence on your life. Without the gospel, the only place that you are headed to is hell. Apart from the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, your life has absolutely no meaning. You can get it right on everything else. You can be a good person. You can do good deeds. You can help old people across the street. Or if you are there, be helped across the street kindly. <laughs> but it means nothing if you get it wrong on Jesus. If you get it wrong on Jesus, everything else in this world is meaningless. You can raise your kids to be good people, but I can remember as a kid, I used to love to listen to Woodrow Kroll. Anybody remember that name, Woodrow Kroll? I would listen before I would go to bed at night, I would go into my room because all it was was women in my house, so it was fun to go in my room because there were no women in there. And I'd go into my room and I'd turn on the radio, and the first thing I would listen to is Woodrow Kroll. And as he would close out his program, he would say, and remember, have a good and godly day. For of what lasting value is a good day if it is not also a godly day? Then I'd listen to Night Sounds with Bill Pierce. And he'd come on with that deep voice. And I'd love, that's what I'd go to sleep to, Night Sounds with Bill Pierce. Tried playing it the other day on YouTube for Stacy. She can't get into that kind of stuff. She's just like, you would listen to this as a kid? No wonder why you were the most boring person I know in this world. <laughs> I, you know, that, that was what I would do after I was finished reading encyclopedias. <laughs> Fun. <laughs> the gospel is the key. It is the foundation stone of Christianity. Apart from the gospel, you can't understand the Bible. Did you know that? Reading the Bible without the gospel is like listening to the teacher on Charlie Brown. Womp, 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 womp. That's all it is. The gospel. Paul is coming to the close of his message to the Corinthians. We're in chapter 15. And as he comes to the close, his farewell is going to be in chapter 16. But he takes one last important section Remember, the Corinthians thought they knew everything. And Paul has been sarcastically telling them, No, you don't know a thing. You think you know this, but you don't. You think you know this, but you don't. You think you know how to live a sin-free life, but you're having sexual immorality on a regular basis, and you are proving nothing but that you are going to hell. He says you think that you know how to be a Christian, but you don't love each other. You're not treating each other charitably. 
He says, you think you know how to walk in this life, but your marriages are a, a shambles, your, your relationships are a shambles, communion has come down to just craziness. And so in light of all that, I think Paul is spurred at the end of 1 Corinthians to say, well, you know what? Maybe you've missed it on the gospel. You know, in a crowd this size, there is a very, very, very good chance that a significant portion of you are sitting here thinking you're going to heaven, but you're really going to hell. People can sit in church week after week after week after week, and they can be charmed by the logic, and they can be charmed by the sweet, chubby face of the preacher. Not a single way men, not even from Stacy. I... <laughs> but at the end of the day, they can still be going to hell. If the rapture happened right now, today, for those of us who believe in the rapture, if you don't, if you believe Jesus came back right now today, how many of you would still be sitting here? It's an important question. Don't take assurance lightly. Don't take assurance lightly. So as Paul comes to a close, he says, listen, I talked to you at the beginning and I called you brethren, but here at the end I want to remind you of the gospel. Because if you've got it wrong on the gospel, then you're not brethren. And that's what he is going to seek to establish. And this is his longest section. Out of all of the different sections that he has been dealing with, he spends the most time talking specifically about the resurrection. And I believe that there's a reason for this, and we'll get into that later. But he spends so much time here talking about the resurrection because he wants the people to understand just how important the cross, the tomb, the empty tomb, and the ascended Lord is. That's the foundation for Christianity. So Paul began in chapter 1 by showing us how important the cross is. And in some great and grand... Now, this is a word you might not be aware of, but there are literary techniques called inclusios, where you'll have something on one side, and then you'll have something on the other side that complements it, and you'll have a lot of stuff in between. And so in one great and grand inclusio, Paul in chapter 1 begins with the cross, and then in chapter 15 he goes on to the resurrection. And everything in between says you need to be influenced by the cross and the resurrection. Christian living has to be influenced by the cross and the resurrection. Christian living, Christian thought has to be influenced by the cross and the resurrection. How you get up in the morning, what you think about, how you respond to people has to be influenced by the cross and the resurrection. So everything in between in Corinthians is not unimportant, but it is influenced by the cross and the resurrection. And this is why he finds this to be such a, an intense and important discussion with the Corinthians. In the opening verses of the chapter, he'll give us the gospel. It's as if he says, here are the basic truths of Christianity. The gospel is how you were brought into the kingdom. But then he transitions to show us that the gospel must contain the resurrection. There are other parts to the gospel. We, we didn't sing all of one day. But there's, when you sing all of one day, one day takes all these different parts. And, and there are multiple layers, you understand, to the gospel. There are multiple facets. It's not just that Jesus Christ, the, the gospel is not just Easter. The gospel is not just Good Friday. The gospel begins in eternity past, and it continues on into eternity future. And it contains the work, the good news of what Christ has accomplished. And so he transitions to show us that if your gospel does not contain the resurrection, then your gospel is defective. It's not enough to know that Jesus died for you. You must know that Jesus lives for you. Are you aware of that? That right now, at this very moment, he lives for you. This is the greatest story ever told. Beginning in verse 1 of 15. 
Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if, I, if you keep in memory, or if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which also I received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he was seen a Cephas, then of the twelve, after that he was seen of above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that he was seen of James, then of all the apostles, and last of all he was seen of me also as one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles, that I am not meet to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. Therefore, whether it were I or they, so we preach, and so ye believed. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Our Father and our God, we pray for wisdom as we consider the gospel. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So what is it that that causes Paul to talk about the resurrection. Well, I believe Corinth is where? Remember, we began this. Corinth is a Greek city. And I believe that Corinth is, it is embracing some of the Greek philosophy, particularly one of the Greek philosophical modes of thought, the most, the most prevalent one, was dualism. Now, what is dualism? Dualism is simply that the body and the soul are at odds with each other, that they're at loggerheads fighting against each other. And Greek thought said that someday, they, Greek thought got so far as in Gnosticism to say that the body doesn't matter at all, and all that really matters is the soul, so that means you can live it up with the body. You can sin in the body, you can do whatever you want in the body, because it doesn't matter. The body's just going to drop dead at some point anyway, shuffed off into the ground. It's the soul that goes on, and anything you do in the body cannot affect the soul. That was Gnosticism. Now, Paul is writing, I believe, to say, listen, you've gotten it wrong on the concept of the body and the soul and how important they are. This, this body and soul at odds with each other is something that the church needs to wholesale reject. Listen, when Jesus saves you, he saves your body as well as your soul. So these people who say, well, you know, my body doesn't really matter, so just, just get rid of it. My great-grandfather used to say all the time, he used to say, ah, when I'm dead, just roll me over the hill and let the crows pick at me. <laughs> Well, why don't we do that? Well, the reason why is because the body is important. The body is precious. And God is one day going to pull that body up out of the ground, and he's going to remake it in the image of Jesus, who has the new body presently. And our new body is going to look like Jesus' new body. The resurrection helps us understand that the body is important. Christianity cannot embrace any thinking where the body is not valued. So when Paul talks about the flesh, because this is the argument that sometimes people give, they say, well, what about when Paul talks about the flesh? He is speaking of the effects of sin that are dealt with in this cursed world. There is an ongoing effect of sin. But in Christ, we now have the choice. This is why Paul had this whole conversation earlier on in 1 Corinthians about the body being what? Boy, that's great. Real great. Glad you all stuck with me for this Corinthians run. The temple. Yes, the temple. The body is the temple. This is the artifact that contains, this vessel contains... The Most High God. Is that not incredible? Is that not mind-blowing? 
That's why the body is important. That's why he says, don't attach the body to a prostitute. That's why he says, treat the body well. That's why Paul's thought is always about the body as well as the soul. Because Christ did not stay in the grave. We sing with joy. Up from the grave he arose with a mighty triumph for his foes. So the topic of the resurrection helps Paul recall the Corinthians from their heretical views on the body. Now we must know that the gospel contains, even though it contains many things, there are two important aspects that he, con he considers here in this chapter. The first important aspect is, guess what? Jesus died. Do you know what the proof of that is? He was buried. You don't bury the living. Number two that he's going to deal with this in this is Jesus rose. You know what the proof of that is? People saw him. There were witnesses. That's what he's going to talk about. That's the direction that he is going to head us in. And this is what we are going to see as we discuss the glorious chapter 15. So let's break the, the text down. The first thing that we see is in verses 1 to 2. This is, if you're keeping notes, the effects of the gospel. The effects of the gospel. Paul begins by stating, here is your reminder. Here is a most important thing for you to remember. What is it? The gospel. Do you know how it is that you stand justified by the, before the throne of God? It's only by the gospel. It's only by what Christ has done. It's only by the effect of the gospel as it is applied to your life through the Holy Spirit. What removes the stain of sin in your life? It's the gospel. As Christ works through. It's the whole picture. It's not just one element. Do you understand that? It's the whole thing, the whole picture that removes the stain. And this is why Paul was saying, this is why we have to understand it. What is the power that sets us free? The power that sets us free is the gospel as it affects us. This was what Paul had preached, verse 1 and verse 2 tells us. He says, I've preached this to you. I've told you about this. Now, we see then that the gospel comes by the primacy of preaching. Preaching is a first-rate institution in the church. It's the chief way of communicating the gospel. But we live in a dopamine-driven society. Do you know that? Everybody has a phone in their hands. Everybody's staring at the phone in their hands. I was sitting in the airport forever. And as I sat in the airport, I had a book in my hands. And I felt like, I felt like they were going to put me in a freak show. Come view the man holding a book. We don't even know what this is anymore. Everybody's staring at their phones. Something about the electronic element, it creates a stimulus in your brain that gives a dopamine response so that people look at it. They look at it. I'm not on Facebook anymore because I found that I was looking at Facebook. And you know what I was doing? Let me show you. I can show you exactly what I was doing. For no purpose. To see what somebody had for lunch today? No offense, I know that Rachel and James love to post there. I'm not picking on you. Remember, I've not seen any posts. If you guys have posted any, uh, that's another reason why I stay off of Facebook. When people say, well, Pastor, did you see my Facebook post the other day? Is that what you were preaching about? I can say, no. <laughs> but people get addicted to these things. We see young people who become so engrossed in how many likes they get. And if they don't get enough likes, they're committing suicide. Because the community doesn't like them. It's frightening. So in this society, <laughs> I get to preach. And do it the old-fashioned way. And people look at you and they say, preaching is dead. Have you heard that? Preaching is dead. Let's entertain. More people want more balls being thrown in church. <laughs> it's a terrible sermon. 
Terrible sermon illustration. More people want activity. Don't, don't let the pastor get up there and preach. Let's have a play about it. A play about it? Really? Let's just, let's just sing songs and, and, and we'll just read a little devotion or we'll just watch a little something on TV and we'll all be good. Paul says here that the gospel comes through the primacy of preaching. This is the means that God has chosen to declare truth to you. Expository preaching of the word of God does what? Do you know what expository preaching does? Sounds very close to the word expository. Exposes. Expository preaching exposes the hearer to the gospel and then entrusts the Holy Spirit to do the work of applying the preaching. I know I can't do the work. This is serious business. You know what I was doing just moments is before I got up, is, is just before we, we, we started to sing the doxology, you know what I was doing? Praying. Asking the Holy Spirit that he would penetrate the gospel into your ears and your hearts and your mind. Spurgeon, as he would mount the steps, Spurgeon's pulpit was high up and he had to climb steps to get up into his pulpit to preach. And as he would mount the steps, with every step he would climb up saying, I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Because without the Holy Spirit, when you get to the pulpit, it's all vain. It's all vain to think that I could stand here and entertain you guys for 40 odd minutes and, and say something that is happy, clippy, zippy, so that you can get up and leave and say, wow, wasn't that just so great? You know, the pastor threw a ball in church today. <laughs> I believe in the Holy Spirit. Only the Holy Spirit can take the declared word of God and make it pierce the ears of dead men and women. And that action by the Holy Spirit is what causes people then to receive the gospel. So I say to you today that if you have never understood the gospel, if you have never understood the awful wretchedness of your sin, if you have never understood the beauty of Jesus Christ, if you have never stood repentantly at the cross, then I have news for you. You are lost and dying and going to hell. And I pray that the Holy Spirit will speak to you today and pierce your dead ears and make you come alive in Christ Jesus so that you will live for eternity. Listen, this body is going on. Why do we get saved? We get saved so that we can have eternal life. You are already eternal. Every single person in this room is eternal. If you go to hell, you will not be ground into non-existence. You will remain in hell underneath the judgment of God, underneath the weight of your own sin, bearing the punishment of your own curse for all eternity. And your body that you will be given, because you'll be given a new body too, your body that you will be given will be uniquely suited to spend eternity in hell where Jesus says the worm dieth not and the flesh or the, the fire is never quenched. Wow. What is the worm that dieth not? I don't even want to guess. But in my mind, I have this horrific image a flesh being devoured by worms that are not dying and the flesh is not going away but it's continuing to be eaten and if you're here today apart from Jesus Christ Jonathan Edwards say you hang over that very pit of hell on a slim silver cord that God at any moment can choose to cut But the gospel received becomes the gospel upon which you stand, verse 1 says. There's no other ground upon which you stand. It is the gospel. We're in the flight coming home. We're, <laughs> me and the mouse in my pocket, I was all by myself. <laughs> We're in the flight. I'm in the flight. I can't speak without the royal we for some reason this morning. I'm in the flight. We're coming into Pittsburgh, 
And as we go to land, the pilot says, we can't see anything, but the plane can land automatically, so we'll just put it in auto. And so we're going down, and I'm thinking to myself the whole time, I stand on the gospel. And we come towards the ground, and you look out the window, and you can't see the wingtips, and then all of a sudden the front end of the plane goes back up in the air and accelerates, and we start flying off into the air. The pilot comes on and says, we can't land in Pittsburgh. He says, we can't see the tarmac. And I'm thinking, I didn't know autopilot had eyes. <laughs> then he says this to us. He says, we have to make an emergency landing in Cleveland because we're almost out of gas. And I'm sitting there thinking to myself, I didn't need to know that. <laughs> so now everybody in the plane is dead silent. And all we're doing is listening if the engines are going to start sputtering. <laughs> and the whole time I'm thinking to myself, I stand on the gospel. And the crazy thing is, is I had not told Stacy that I was coming home early and I had been lying to her the whole day before saying that I, I, I was doing this and doing that and wasn't doing this and that. I was sitting in LAX airport waiting and I'm thinking to myself, this is how I go out. <laughs> Don't even get to say goodbye to the family, just poof. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Precious memories. <laughs> But the whole time I'm thinking, what do I stand on? I stand on the gospel. If I die in a plane wreck, what does it matter in the great big scheme of things? I stand on the gospel. And as someone who stands on the gospel, my eternity is secure, even if they aren't going to find enough of me to scrape up and put in a box and put in the ground. My Lord has said that my eternity is secure. That's the power of the gospel. Verse 2 explains that the gospel is not static. You don't receive the gospel. You understand the difference between stasis and something that's moving, something that's standing still, and something that's moving. It, the gospel is not static. It is not something that you receive the gospel, and then you just say, okay, here I am, I'm in the gospel. And then you're able to leave it and go on about your life. Now, I want you to hear this, because this is very important. You need to hear this. It is impossible to have assurance of your faith and continually live in sin. Do you know that the two do not go hand in hand? If you are continually living in sin, you do not get to stand there and say, well, I'm glad I'm saved anyway. Present faith does not trump past faith. Did you hear that? Pre this is not works-based salvation, but this is the truth of what we are taught in Scripture. Present faith does not trump past faith. So these people who say to you, well, I know I'm going to heaven because I prayed a prayer. I say to you, no, I know I'm going to heaven because I am held in the Almighty's hand right now. Right now. And the evidence of that is that keep walking closer and closer and closer and closer to him. If you are walking further and further and further and further away from him, then chances are you have never been changed by the gospel. If you can live in sin, if you can live in the body of sin, and if you can be happy and content in sin, then you have never been changed by the gospel. Because what we believe around here is the same thing that old Dr. Rogers used to say. He used to say the faith that fizzles before the finish was flawed from the first. So if your faith doesn't take you all the way to the grave, it was not faith in the beginning. The person who hears and then lets go of the gospel, that person has had a vain faith. Let me sum it up this way. That faith will not follow through to the end. If you don't trust the gospel now, then you didn't trust the gospel in the past. The second thing we see is in verses 3 to 4, and it's the declaration of the gospel. Verses 3 to 4 give us the most succinct declaration of the gospel. What is it? How that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures 
and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Verse 3 tells us first of the transmission or the highway or the channel of the gospel. How did it come? Peter or Paul says that it came to him, it was delivered to him, and what was delivered to him then he goes and gives to you. What does this mean? Why is this important? It's important for you to know this because it means that Paul did not invent the gospel. Paul did not imagine the gospel. Paul received the gospel and then he delivered the gospel. So whenever you share the biblical gospel, you're doing the same thing that Paul was doing. You are delivering what you have received. And what is the message delivered that was received? Well, it is the message that Jesus died for our sins. What does that mean? Well, in Romans, Paul says that Christ was made sin for us. What does that mean? Peter says that Jesus bore our sins in his own body. What does that mean? It simply means that Christ took up the sin debt. It was not that Christ became sinful. There was no internal sin in Jesus Christ. But yet he bore the very punishment that mankind was to bear. And Paul affirms all this. He says this was foretold. This was prophesied in the scripture. So the only remedy for sin was found in the prescription that God gave. And that's most clearly found, if I had time, I'd take you to Isaiah 53, and I would walk you through Isaiah 53 and show you exactly how it was foretold. But suffice it to say that you have in Isaiah 53 the suffering servant of the Lord that the Father has determined that he would allow him to suffer in order that mankind might go free. The only way to expunge or to remove entirely sin is by death. There is no other means that could pay the cost of the awful debt. And the scriptures explain this. Isaiah 53 explains this. The, the sacrificial system. If you ever read Leviticus and say, what is Leviticus for? It's to remind you that this is the cost of, of sin. This is the debt. Every time they drag an animal up to the altar, every time they take the unwilling animal and they take a sharp knife and slit its throat and empty its blood all over the place, the entire purpose is to cause you to stare at that wretched scene and say, this is what it would cost for me to pay this. And every single animal that was brought, thousands upon thousands upon thousands upon thousands of animals, never once expunged the sin. They only covered the sin. And it was only so that God could come down and dwell with man on the earth. The Old Testament sacrificial system was only good enough to bring God down to earth to dwell with man. So what is it going to take to expunge, not cover my sins? What is it going to take so that I, man, can dwell with him, God? Well, it's only Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. He is the only sacrifice worthy. He is the only one that can expunge the debt. And when he hung on the cross, he took my sins actually. Not potentially, but actually. And he took them upon, myself, on, upon himself. And he bore the punishment for them. He is the only one that could arrest the sacrificial system. He is the only one that could allow men to dwell with God. And if the Holy Spirit has taken up residence in you, then you rejoice at the name of Jesus. It causes you to think differently. Old things are passed away. All things have become new. Because of Jesus. That's how important Jesus is. The evidence of his death, verse 4 says, is his burial. You don't bury the living, you bury the dead. They had wrapped him in spices. And I cannot get over the fact that the one who sustains the whole world is at the same time wrapped in clothes and lying dead in a borrowed tomb. I cannot get over the fact that the very one who breathed the breath of life into Adam is the same one who now lies breathless in the tomb. 
I can't get over the fact that the very one, I got up this morning, I don't know if you thought about it or not, I didn't think about it, but I'm thinking about it now, my heart was going boom, 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 boom. And what was it doing? It was, it's pumping my blood. And the very one who keeps that heart pumping lay in a tomb with his heart still. It's hard to imagine. But the gospel does not stay in the tomb. Paul goes on and says he didn't stay dead. He resurrected in glorious triumph, showing that the curse no longer held sway over him. Have you ever thought about this? Think about this. You know, you, you guys are all in a seated position. So you're sitting down and you're thinking to yourself, okay, at some point the pastor is going to be done preaching. We're going to rejoice in glorious harmony and eat the food that smells so good. And you're going to do this, right? Now, some of you are going to do this. <laughs> and some of you are going to do this. <laughs> and slowly get up. And the, the older you get, what happens? The slower it is, right? But eventually, someday, you're not going to pull yourself up. Eventually, you might have to have somebody else pull you up. And then eventually, you'll reach the point. I, I went in with my piano teacher just before I left for California, and for an hour, we talked about Jesus. And he talked about how he couldn't wait to go see Jesus. And he, he said, you know, Nathan, he said, I can't get up out of this bed anymore. He said, they've got to get me up out of this bed. And he said, but one day I will get up but not under his own power. Every person that goes to the grave stays in the grave and will not get up under their own power. The only one that can get you up out of the grave is Jesus. And he was the only one who got up out of the grave under his own power. And when he did that, he said, this no longer has sway over me and my people. Wow. That's the power of the gospel. Well, then what do we see? We see the third thing. We see the witness of the gospel in verses 5 to 8. So the first thing we saw was the effect of the gospel. The second thing we see is the declaration of the gospel. And then the third thing we see is the witness of the gospel in verses 5 to 8. What is the witness of the gospel? We're given a laundry list of names and people groups to show us that this was not one guy declaring something that's absolutely unbelievable. Paul says, you want to know about the resurrection? Ask Peter. That's who Cephas is. He says, you want to know about the resurrection? Ask the twelve. He says, you want to know about the resurrection? Ask the 500 who watched him ascend. He says, you want to know about the resurrection? Ask James, Jesus' brother, who saw him. And then he says, if you want to know about the resurrection, ask all the apostles. Then finally, he says, if you want to know about the resurrection, ask me, because I saw him too on the Damascus Road. Now, we need not examine every instance that Jesus was seen, but we must know that Jesus did not hide himself between the resurrection and the ascension. He taught, he explained, he comforted, and he prepared his people for what he was about to do, ascend, and what they were about to do, carry the gospel. So what's the final thing that we see in verses 9 to 11? Well, we see the preachers of the gospel. Paul closes out this introductory section by showing the unity of the gospel. Paul first lays out his past life, and he says, look at how dramatically the gospel changes lives. I shouldn't have been called an apostle. I killed Christians. I held the coat, coats of the men who stoned Stephen. But yet here I am, changed by the gospel. Look how it has changed me. He says, God's grace was not in vain in my life. This harkens back to verse 2. This is not in vain. Paul is saying, I've had a radical change, and then it's almost as if the implication is, have you, Corinthians, had a radical change? How do I know I'm saved? Well, I'm in Christ right now. God's sustaining hand keeps me in Christ right now. 
Paul goes on to say that despite his persecution of the church, he has eventually labored more abundantly than anybody else. But he says, I don't have any boast in that. He takes all of that that he has done, all of his missionary journeys, all of his missionary work, and he lays it down at Grace's feet. And he said, this is the reason why. God's incredible grace. This is what it does to me. And Paul says, look how all of the gospel preachers are united in this. This is the full gospel that they have declared, verse 11 says. Therefore, whether it were I or they, so we preach and so ye believed. This is the united effect of the gospel amongst preachers. So that means that I get to be in this great line of preachers, such as Paul, such as John, such as Chrysostom, such as Athanasius, such as John Huss, such as John Calvin and Martin Luther, such as John Bunyan, such as John Newton, a lot of Johns, such as Robert Murray McShane, such as Charles Spurgeon, such as even old men like Dan Kaminsky and Howard Cole. I get to stand with those witnesses of the gospel, and we're united in our declaration of the gospel. We are crying out, come to Jesus. And it's all, all according to the scriptures. So we close with this question. Have you come? If not, then what's keeping you? What keeps you from the gospel? I ask you this question. Are you rejoicing over the gospel? If so, then why? What makes the gospel so special to you? There are only two kinds of people that are here today. The saved and the lost. There's no in-between. So in which group are you? What has the gospel done in your life? Amen? Let's pray. Our gracious God and our loving Heavenly Father, if there is someone here today who has never received the gospel, now is the day of salvation. We pray, Father, that the Holy Spirit would penetrate the heart and that he would do a heart transplant in them and rip out the stony heart from their chest and replace it with a heart filled with the gospel. We pray, Father, that they would come. Stimulate them to come. Call those that are yours to yourself today. We pray, Father, for those here who are living already in the gospel. May their lives exemplify what it means to be a gospel-loving Christian. If they are living in sin, call them back to yourself. If they're living in false assurance, break their hearts, cause them to weep, cause them to mourn over their playing with their own eternity. And we pray, Father, that you would be honored and you would be glorified. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.